All right. What's up, everybody? I am interviewing Todd Bellinger for the, I don't know, 58th time. Uh, I don't I don't know what the number is, but I've interviewed this man quite a few times, known him for multiple decades, you know, truly one of the great innovators and strategic minds in mortgage. What's up, Todd? What's up, Big D? All right, man. So uh, you, you are my first formal interview around going beyond loan manufacturing. I had a, a conversation this weekend on Saturday with Jim Deitch and you know, I wanted to make sure that this LinkedIn post that I'm writing, and I'm actually creating an article around it, that I wasn't drinking too much of my own Kool-Aid, you know, so I wanted to get a little sanity check. And uh, he he definitely validated it. And I haven't done an interview like this uh, formally yet, but I'm, I'm planning to do a whole series of interviews about going beyond loan manufacturing. So, so I'm going to tee it up and then Todd, feel free to interrupt me anytime throughout, you know, just, you know, one, share your own color or two, um, ask a question. Sounds great. Sounds good. All right, cool. So, uh, so guys, here's, here's my thesis. So this so what, first define, since this is kind of a new topic, define loan manufacturing for somebody that's never heard that term or, or maybe there, there we go. Yeah. There we go. You know, and by the way, guys, he is a college level professor, professor at the University of North Carolina. Uh, so the loan manufacturing, in my mind, starts when disclosures are triggered. So and and when a company starts to invest money, which typically happens when a Social Security number is asked and a credit report is run, you know, and and then. In this example, there is a case to be made that loan manufacturing goes through servicing, but I'm going to just say that, hey, it goes through a closed loan that is eligible to be either put into a servicing portfolio or sold off to someone who else who's going to service it. That's the loan manufacturing front and start. You think I got it or anything missing? No, that's good. And, and would you say, what percentage of that would you say is back office versus front office as, as, as part of the functional process of, you know, the lending industry? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, well, I mean, I do, I do, because when you say front office and back office, are you talking about processing the loan? And then when does it get into what's back office? Is back office underwriting? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, you think of people going out as salespeople trying to create opportunities. And that's normally an outreach marketing and sales function. And they're heavily involved until the application's taken. And then it moves into often processing and service. I mean, all that stuff you're talking about. So manufacturing, you know, if you think about a product, there's always people design the car and everything. And then there's people that are sitting back there in the manufacturing side, you know, building the car. So do you think of this as, manufacturing end to end, like from the very first touch of the client to the very end, Absolutely. or do you think manufacturing is yeah. like more after the app is boarded? And no, not- no, I think it, it includes that because I do yeah. think, and the case I'm going to make is that the technology that lenders pay for and require loan officers to use starts at that point. You know, yeah. what, what the loan officer does in front, you know, while lenders, it's not uncommon that they'll pay for the CRM now. But it's it's unheard of that they're going to require the use of the CRM. Uh, But when it comes to how an application comes in, you know, whatever their POS is, they don't have, oh, I I don't like Blend. I want to use Simple Nexus. No, we have one POS platform. And it's not like, oh, I get to use whatever LOS I want or I get to use whatever pricing engine I want. And so, I, you know, part of the case I'm going to make is that lenders have put a lot of money and a lot of leadership into when a credit report's run. You know, loan officers aren't going out and getting their own credit, you know, vendors. They're they're putting it in the LOS. And and so a lot of the case is going to be made with, we got to go beyond that thinking and we need to start bringing leadership and investments in technology beyond loan manufacturing. Gotcha. Got you, but it's full cool. and the way you're talking about it. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And th- by the way, thank you for that. I think it will make this an even more valuable piece of content. So, so guys, this is, this is the data. I mean, this is the MBA's latest profitability report. 
And, you know, notice that the industry has been negative anywhere from five basis points. 99 was the most, but, you know, 20, 100, 69, 19, you know, there's just a lot. And that's industry loss. And, and guys, you know, I, I'm working on getting even more data, more specific data on this, which I will have soon. But technology costs in the mortgage business has gone up. Uh, and, you know, specifically, you know, when the rocket went off, there was no such thing as a point of sale technology platform before that. POS was unheard of. But rocket went off, you know, click, get mortgage became a thing. And there was another category that was created. And and once upon a time, lenders didn't pay for CRM. You know, that was kind of an investment, um, but they really didn't make it beyond the transaction. Like now it's just this optional thing. We have to have it so we can check the box. There are some transactional updates that a lender will either mandate or manage. But when it comes to like, what do loan officers do in front of loan manufacturing? If loan officers want to pay for their own CRM, if loan officers want to do things, they get to do it. And so my my whole thesis is forever, you know, but let's just say the past decade, uh, lenders have put a lot of money, applied a lot of leadership. And, and my thesis is why? Because one, they have to deliver a compliant transaction or they're out of business and they have to compl- deliver a saleable transaction or they can't scale and they're out of business. So it's like, they have to do that. So first of all, I am not suggesting take your foot off the pedal. You know, like that's not what I'm saying. But but if you want to be profitable in a sustainable way, you need to start thinking beyond that and you need to start investing leadership and money beyond that. And so, so here's another data point. And this is just, this is the facts. You know, this is, this is what, our leadership is an industry and the way we've implemented technology, this is where it's got us, you know, uh, underwriting hasn't become more efficient, you know, from a headcount perspective and loan officers haven't become more efficient as a headcount. We did have a little COVID blip where, where loans were falling out of the sky. And, and, and so we did see that, but I mean, it's pretty steadily, you know, gone down in terms of the productivity. So so kind of coming back to my thesis, continuing to do what we're doing and not thinking differently, not doing the math differently, um, is not probably the, you know, status quo is not the path to sustainable profits. So Professor Ballinger, would that be a good good point to make? Do you align with that? Yeah, I'm just kind of, as I listen to you talk, there's this this sort of burning question of, of I, I agree with you that I've seen a tremendous, I mean, I'd say the lion's share of budget go to what I would call back office efficiency, making the processing faster, making the credit report, you know, this and that, and and very little invested in a lot of the, you could call it the things that in many ways really matter, you know, the, the high touch points with uh, the consumer experience and that ability to differentiate yourself when people are given multiple names, which which happens quite a bit. And I'm kind of curious. I mean, to me, it seems so obvious at one level that that you can only get a certain level of efficiency in the manufacturing process by making things more efficient. Um, and you know, it really then comes down to how do you make things more effective, right? Because Traditionally, you get about a 20% ROI over time on efficiency and about an 80% ROI on effectiveness when people, you know, measure efficiency and effectiveness kind of dynamics. And so in what you're talking about, I mean, what is it that makes the loan officer more effective and by making them more effective makes the company more effective? Because I thought I think the efficiency game is tapped out. I mean, how much faster can you you know, uh, I mean, you know, not completely, but I mean, how do you keep putting money and time and energy into efficiency when the people that are out there doing the business are in some ways? Well, 
I, 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 I have some ideas on that. But by, right. by the way, I want to, first of all, because when I first started working this, I'm going, well, what about how many days faster has it gotten to do alone? And, you know, and then this is, you know, average days from application to closing. So as I define loan manufacturing, guys, here, here it is, you know, banks, independents, an average. And, you know, obviously we had the COVID bubble where the industry slowed down, but it looks like it's gotten a little better, you know? It looks like it's trending down, so it's going in the right direction, but it's not, it's not, you know, clearly the spend and the time and the leadership has not, um, we haven't radically improved the speed to the consumer. We haven't improved the efficiency of the loan officer. And last time I checked, the number one line item on a on a P and L is LO compensation. So you're you know the industry's number one P and L is loan officer compensation, and so that leads me to think, hmm, what could we do in front of that experience to improve? And is there a lot of juice for the squeeze? And so. First of all, I'm going to share a couple of data. By the way, do you want to say something? Before yeah, I well, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen these slides. So uh, that's fascinating to me, what you just showed, that since 2005, we're basically back to the same average closing period of 40 days. How much money between 2005 and today has been spent on accelerating or speeding up the closing process? And at the end of the day, while it may be helpful to some consumers, how many consumers look back on their experience and say, man, I love working with Dave. He closed my loan in 29 days. I mean, is that, is that effective? Is that how we're measuring? Cause you know, how we measure stuff is really important. And sometimes I wonder about how we measure things within the industry. We measure, you know, things by rate or, uh, you know, 40 days to close a loan. And suddenly that becomes something that's really important, but is it really important to the client? And, how much money has been spent on that? How much time and energy has been spent on that to get to where we are now? And clearly we haven't moved the needle a whole lot. So anyway, that was, yeah. I thought it was really cool. Yeah, I, I saw this is completely unrelated, but I saw this, this story the other day. It was fascinating. Uh, these uh, university scientists were talking about, and they had been studying over like this 20, 30 year period tornadoes. And the tornadoes, the number of tornadoes kept growing exponentially and they were trying to come up with a solution. They just thought it was all, you know, weather and this and this and that. And one day the scientist kind of walks into the room and looks at it and says, well, this is following the exponential growth of technology that can detect tornadoes. And he matched a perfect curve on the power of the radar towers that had been installed over time and the increase in the number of tornadoes. You follow me? There were, yeah. no, there were no more tornadoes. It's just we got better at finding tornadoes, but no one was looking at that. They were all looking at, oh my God, they're 60, they're 80, they're 90, they're average of this many tornadoes. And no one was looking at the fact that the technology was getting better and better and better along the way. You know what I mean? So it's like those kind of things you kind of have to scratch your head about and wonder, all right, uh, what else is happening out there? And, and, and is it really important? Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, here's, here's something that is reporting. And, uh, you know, here here at Trust Engine Mortgage Coach, we we have a number of clients that track the loan officers that use our technology at the point of sale. And at NFM, the 94 loan officers who use Mortgage Coach were 65 basis points more profitable than the 319 that didn't. That was a combination of gross margin, that gross margin, and less concessions. And plus, so plus 10% higher conversion. So 10% more, you know, one out of every 10 credit reports turned into a loan more than the non-mortgage coaches. You know, here's another client that found, you know, that 10 basis points more are fewer exceptions, 29 basis points more gross margin. You know, 41 basis points, gross margin. And so, you know, it got me thinking, you know, I, and I haven't told this story a lot because I actually forgot it until recently. 
when, when I founded Mortgage Coach, I was I was reading a book. I can't remember which one it was, but it was about Six Sigma. And I was just trying to better, you know, I was looking to improve the profitability and the production. And as you said, it, Todd, the effectiveness of myself as an originator and of the company that I had. And, and I started, um, I read this one term in Six Sigma, it's called moments of truth, where those are just touch points is, you know, a touch point to the consumer that has an enhanced, you know, it enhances their view as you as a company. And I started looking at the fee worksheet and start going, you know what, this, this could be enhanced. And, and by the way, guys, these are all TCAs that are either, you know, this year, they're within the past couple of years. And this is the way loan officers still quote rates, even though this was invented in 1999, you know, this is how loan officers still quote rates. And, but a mortgage coach, and by the way, this is just one touch point. I mean, I know I'm Mr. Mortgage Coach, so I'm pretty passionate about our, our technology and our touch point. But it's just one example where if a loan officer, instead of doing this, they do this, they get, they're more profitable. You know, they're giving a better experience to the consumer. And, and it and it got me thinking that literally, if you are a C-suite executive, you want to get out of this profitability crisis that you're in. The answer is not what you're doing in the in the loan manufacturing. I do think we're going to start to see with AI coming, and I do believe over the next few years, we will see a lot of technology investment promises actualized in loan manufacturing. So by no means am I saying take the eye off that, but I am absolutely saying, and I know firsthand because I've sold to the C-suite for many a years, and the, most of the companies that have our technology, they put a one they don't pay for it for the loan officers, two they don't they don't invest the leadership energy in teaching and training and and showing loan officers like look loan officers that use this. Are this profitable? Like there's there's on a scale of one to 10, the industry's like at a two of investing time and leadership in that. And and literally when you look at the basis points, like this one touch point could solve the finance, the the profit crisis. If lenders, this is now part of loan manufacturing here at whatever company, we it's built into our LOS, it's built into our our product and pricing engine. All of our fee engines go into it. This is the compliant way to quote rates and loans at this company. And, and you need to have a minimum level of training, profitable. Uh, the industry's profit profitability crisis is over. Go beyond the transaction. Todd? What do you think is the first moment where that's the most critical for a loan officer when it comes to you know they're meeting with a client they're talking to them what's that moment of truth where the client really gets that they're in the right place that's so funny because i uh i just got done doing a uh, a webinar with a, a large lender i mean a top top 30 lender over 500 loan officers and i was doing a training and towards the end, we were doing some Q and A, and one of the the loan officers asked a really good question, and he was getting grinded, you know. So he had quoted a rate, he had already lowered his price, he'd already built a price concession into it, and you know, he was competing with a low price later, and he was like, "What should I do?" And I. I gave him a move, you know, that we teach, you know, like, hey, when you are negotiating concession, show your loan versus your competition. And then instead of negotiate based off of an eighth in rate, which is a lot of basis points, figure out what the cost is over a year. And whatever that, you know, if it's less than $2,000 $2, over the course of a year, you may not need to give a concession. And if you do give a concession, negotiate dollars, not rates because negotiating those basis points is a lot more. But but to answer your question, it's the moment they start talking to you. It's, it's, you know, I always say that if you want to be 
interesting. You need to be interested. And so I, I think it really resonates to what you teach and what you train that it's it starts with how interested you are in that consumer, the questions you ask. And, and again, to the point I make it going beyond loan manufacturing, it starts by how interested you are, how many questions you ask before you prescribe or quote a rate. I don't know if you have a different answer. I'd love to hear it, but that's no, my answer. No, I, I think, I think, I think we're spot on that, that, that there's such value in helping people um, reveal to themselves what they really want or why they're really doing something. Right. So, and, and a lot of times when they come there and they say, I'm, I'm here, I want to, why am I here? Well, I want to buy a house. No, well, actually, I, I can't help you with that. Why, why are you here? Well, I want to I want to borrow money to buy a house. Okay, why are you borrowing money? Well, because I can't pay cash. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, I'm not saying that's the process, but in if you stop and actually ask them, you know, why they're there in that process, you help them to reveal to themselves why they're there. And therefore, what do they really value? And what problem are you helping them solve and I think, you know, there's really a, a moment of truth where they're clear about what they really want and need. And then simultaneously, and it often happens at the same time, it's at that moment they realize that you're the person to help them, right? Because if you're the person that helps them identify what they really want and what they're really trying to accomplish, which sometimes it's a house, sometimes it's a home, sometimes it's, you know, qualifying some you know whatever but even qualifying is 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 has a certain implication to it but just just you know talking to them about what they really are trying to do is you it's like say listen a hole in them right you know just just literally you listen to them so intently that they hear themselves and that's when you know you're really listening is when a person starts to hear themselves because a lot of people talk and they don't listen to what they're saying so you have to reflect that back to them in the conversation and and again, you're just really curious. I mean, that's where if you're really curious, uh, it's amazing what happens to people when you're talking to them. And then they start to sort of realize, oh, this is not just about buying a house. It's about, you know, security and family and, you know, and cash flow and money and wealth. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot kind of embedded in that home buying process that I think we don't spend a lot of time, you know, talking about. But yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And that for any Mortgage professional listen to this, to any manager listen to this. Uh, Todd and I had this conversation because we're both uh, very passionate about helping consumers achieve the real American dream, which is it does include home ownership, but it's it's financial freedom with home ownership. And and you know, Todd has dedicated his career um primarily, you know, educating, teaching. You know, he's an author, he's got you know, what I think is one of the most valuable blogs in housing, uh, you know, and Todd, I want you to share that in a minute. And then I've dedicated myself to, you know, creating technology that helps loan officers be mortgage advisors. And now with this uh, NAR settlement, Todd, I feel like this is the best opportunity that's ever happened to our mission because realtors are going to have to go beyond Real estate manufacturing, you know, used to be if you were a buyer's agent, first of all, you didn't have to negotiate your comp. You didn't have to get a signed buyer's agreement. You you just went right into the the art of living, you know, what school district, what house, do you like it? Does it feel like home? And and now real estate agents are gonna care about advice. And I think they're going to be a lot more attracted to mortgage advisors that are mortgage coaches and that are doing everything we're talking about. And so I'm yeah. I'm, I'm I'm trying to get to the C-suite like, guys, you could be profitable today if you really invested money in technology like mortgage coach. And then if you invested leadership energy into holding higher standards and doing more training, like the profitability crisis is over if you go beyond loan manufacturing. So that's that's the full thesis. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the realtor is going to have to differentiate themselves 
a totally different way. And that's going to come through the partners that they choose to work with or, or the teams. You know, we, we always talk about the wealth team, but I see this as another big nudge towards the power of a realtor and a lender and a financial advisor working together on a client. Yeah, the wealth yeah. team. And, and, and lenders, you could be the captain of the wealth team. Todd and I, I mean, we when we became friends, God, it was, it was in the 90s, years. right? Yeah, we were we were six, seven years old. Al between no, was the, going, one day. Yeah, no, it was you uh, as you were coming out of um, being a part owner in mortgage.com. And yeah, and we 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 both I, always understood the power of the 1003 and that, you know, there's no advisor in America that has more data. And Todd really pursued the first that period of his career helping uh companies like um um Meriprise, Schwab, Schwab, AIG, Meriprise get into the mortgage game. Like, hey guys, you you need to bring your advice game into the mortgage space. And I was like, hey, mortgage people, you need to bring the mortgage game into financial advisors. And you know, here we are 30 years later. Yeah, man. Still rocking it out. Still fly, still time still flying. Yeah. I have a feeling we'll so, be doing 85. So a couple things. So one, I any closing thoughts, Todd, on this topic? I mean, I feel like I got some clarity. I think you helped me tell the story a little better. I think I got a lot of quotes for some of the content I'm creating, but any any closing thoughts for you? Hmm. That you know, just uh, it, this may not sound like this may seem like a non sequitur, but embrace the change. This we are in the golden age of everything. I mean, we have never been as a country more fiscally capable and technologically capable. Unfortunately, a lot of that's outstripping our capacity as humans to to handle the speed of change. But if you embrace it and kind of let go at the same time and just, man, just, just have fun, play with this stuff and get out there. And I don't know, man, I'm, I feel like a, a, a pig in shit every day. You know, I get up and it's like, there's new AI stuff and there's new, this new technology and the, the, the data and the beauty of the data that you're just sharing and the accessibility to it. There's so much out there. It's a great time to be an optimist, you know? I've met, I've met very few wealthy pessimists in my life. So uh, as you think about this sort of industry that we're in and all the changes that are going on, it's a really good time to embrace the change and just, just have fun with it and go with it and reinvent yourself every day. Just kind of let go of what you think of, of as, as, as to what I do and the value I provide. I mean, if it's working for you, keep it. But at the same time, it's kind of cool time. It's cool time to be in the industry. I know it's painful. I know the rates suck and inventory sucks. I mean, there's all these kind of, you know, factors out there, but they are what they are. It's just, it's just, it's just like the weather, right? So there's a yeah. lot of really cool stuff happening. So here's, here's my closing thoughts, guys. So this, this is an image that I got from Todd. I was getting, preparing for a, a board meeting and I want to remind everybody to follow Todd's blog, borrowsmartuniversity.com forward slash blog. And, and here's, here's my closing thought in mortgage. And I, and you said it, I mean, I think I cut and pasted this. I edited a few things down here, but guys, we are playing in the biggest game in history. It is debt. And, and here at Trust Engine, we're, we think we're going to play a very big role with how this all shakes out. Um, but you, you as a loan officer, as a lender are playing a really big role in this. And, and there's another slide I get from Todd. It's like one of my all time favorite slides that Todd ever created. Um, of course my marketing team made our colors. I don't know. Do you like our colors better or your colors, Todd? Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to stay with my colors, but I like yeah. it. Yeah. But it, this is Todd's image. You know, I've updated some of the numbers, uh, because they become more current. Um, but but guys, debt is the biggest game in town. And then when you look at equity, like guys, equity is at an all-time high. There's just so much leverage, so much value the mortgage industry can bring to uh, America. 
that it it really is a profound time to be a mortgage professional. Also want to push all mortgage leaders to to go beyond just loan transactions. And I I founded First Home IQ with Kristen because we really believe that both mortgage and real estate professionals can go into high schools and colleges and teach this. Todd is, you know, um, helping with that. Todd's also got a, an incredible nonprofit that that is one of the top financial literacy nonprofits in the country. So Todd, as we close out, tell people all the best places to follow you, all the best places that they can, you know, learn from you. And, uh, and together we will uh, hopefully make a difference. Yeah, man. Well, again, at least if you sign up for the blog newsletter, you'll get something from me every Friday with just all my thoughts from the week on lending. And it's actually real estate assets and liabilities, kind of the three-legged stool that we teach in our program. As you'll see that reflected in the newsletter, there's usually uh, something inspirational as well, something very tactical that's going on that I think people ought to know about. And you know, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about what we do, just go to barsmartuniversity.com and you can see we have, you know, a designation training program community, uh, a lot of really cool stuff going on there. We've got a great community that uh, is, is growing and people that are studying with us and learning and collaborating and, and doing exactly what you're talking about, you know, Dave, investing in the other part of the business that is developing the people that really make this stuff work. Because I, again, I think with tools like AI, they're going to become incredible tools that will be used by people to get even more done with less time and energy, but it's gonna make the importance of differentiating yourself as a human really, really important as well. And how do you do that, right? So that's a lot of the fun stuff we enjoy you know, exploring and talking about. All right, well, hopefully everybody got value. If you stayed to the end, you are a mortgage nerd. You are <laughs> our people. Uh, let's get out there, let's make changes. Any links that we had, I'll put them down below. And uh, if anybody wants a um, the slides that I shared or anything, I, I you go to savageinsights.com. There is also a mobile club. It's usually one of the top three links. Make sure you subscribe to that. About two to three times a week, I, I put a text out uh, for both mortgage executives and mortgage professionals that wanna wanna win. You wanna you wanna be an advisor be part of that Savage Insights text club and um, just text me that you want the slides and we'll get them to you. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Dave.